Um, we're going to spend some time talking about NetBeans, which is a IDE or integrated development environment for Java. And um, it would be similar use for Java, like you might use Visual, Visual Studio to write C sharp programs. And we're also going to talk about different ways that a Java applications are um, distributed, deployed from people. One way, of course, is to have the program simply installed on your computer. And we'll talk about how you can make program to be installed on a computer because you don't want to give people your source code, right? Uh, more than likely, you don't want to give them their source code and force them to have to compile it and run it. You want to give them a nice deliverable, which they can easily run, similar to an executable in, um, in, in other languages. So we're going to talk about NetBeans. Um, one thing I'm going to show you is how to bring an existing code into NetBeans. So I have high low game classes here. And to simplify things, because it's a little bit of a pain to deal with images. So I got rid of the images. We'll just display the numbers of things. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to import this into a NetBeans application. So let me start up NetBeans. And I'm going to create an application and then I'm going to import my code into it. So to add an application, I'm going to hit the project. You have a number of different choices to, to make of the kind of project that we create. This is kind of similar to what you would have in Visual Studio. Whereas you could create a console application or a model view controller application or a razor pages or whatever. But these are different kinds of applications. For the simple applications we're going to create, we're going to go under Java with Maven. And we're going to pick Java application. What that will do is we'll go through a series of questions and it will set up our application for us. We click next. First thing that asks us is it asks us for the name of the application. And since this is my high low game, I'll call it high low game. Where do I want to put it? Well, I'm going to put it in this class. I'm going to put it on my desktop. You know, you would put it wherever it made sense for you. thing you're asked for is for a group ID. And then you ask for a package. You group Java classes together that serve a particular function into what are called packages. Uh, you then can take and include these packages similar to what we do when we use an import. Uh, an import to import other packages into our code so that we can point to what particular objects and classes that we want to use. Normally, this is done with what's called a reverse URL. And the reason that's done is it guarantees uniqueness. So, for example, here I am at Lorraine County Community College. So, what I'm going to use for my package name, for my group name and package name, is it's going to start out with our URL, but in reverse. So edu dot Lorraine CCC dot Java maybe dot Zellers. And that's going to be my package name. Say hi low. 
that'll be the package name. So everything will be all my classes that have to do with this application will be put into this package. Now, in larger applications, we may have multiple packages, but in this case, we're just going to deal with a single package. But notice that that's a URL, but in reverse. Normally, like the URL for Lorraine Community would be lorraineccc.edu, but it's written in reverse. This guarantees uniqueness, all right? So this is a way to keep my classes separate. So I'm the only Zellers here that does Java programming. So this would guarantee that this is my stuff and my stuff alone. All right, so that's the package name that we're going to use. So we'll go in here under package name and we'll put in the group ID of edu. And I'll just leave the package name as high low. I won't throw in the Java and the Zellers, but we could put that in if we wanted to. Now I'm going to click finish and it's going to create file structure for me in that folder. And we'll take a look at the file structure and we'll outside of NetBeans and we'll take a look at it inside of NetBeans as well. So I click finish here. It does its thing. And it generates some folders. Generates a place for our. Source packages. This is our source classes, our uh, Java code. And in this case, it created a dummy ILO game Java for us. That's simply the hello world application. All right. If I were to run this, it comes up and compiles it. That's what it needs to do. And actually gives me a compile error. Press interface or enum expected. Oh. I must have added a, an extra character at the end of it. Let me run it. Now, and we'll see our result. Build a success, and the output is shown here. Hello, world. So, pretty straightforward. Now, what you're required to do is you're required to create a uh, rock, paper, and scissors game. So, you'll probably have a GUI, and you'll probably have a rock, paper, and scissors game object. And the nice thing about this is that you have IntelliSense. If I were to create another class, for example, I would right, right mouse on this and say new Java class. I could give it a name, like for example, rock, paper, scissors. Put it in this package. And I could go and create this, and I could create attributes. I could create a method. The nice thing is, is this, you'll have IntelliSense with this. I'll just have to return it while. Notice I forget to put the semicolon, it tells me. 
and it tells me it's missing a semicolon. So this will be useful in catching maybe some of the errors that you had through uh, typing or, or through carelessness or whatever. Then what I can do here is if I say, I do r dot, it shows me a list of all the functions I can call. So I can I can see that say hello is one of the functions and I can call that. And because it doesn't show with the red squiggly, it means that there's no error with it. Everything's okay. But you'll have that built in uh, IntelliSense that will tell you what is legal and what is not. So that should make coding uh, a little bit more straightforward to you. All right, now I already have some classes prepared, so I'm going to get rid of these classes. I delete them. And I'm going to go out. I'm going to copy my already written classes. I'm going to copy into ILO game folder under SRC, under main, under Java, EDU, Lorraine CCC, high low game. So notice how each part, after you get past source main Java, that is the package name that we've given in reverse URL order. So I'm going to paste my code in here. So I copied all of those uh, classes into that folder. Now, oh, it does show them. And if I run it, it actually gives me an error because it does not know what the main method that I'm supposed to call is. right mouse on this and go for properties. And under run, I have to choose my main class. So I'll make my main class the high low GUI. Select main class. Now, when I go to run it, it should run okay because it knows what class to call now. And there's our GUI. And so it's running the program. And I can take low, play, I win because it rolled a two and a four. Like I said before, I eliminated images from this one simply because images are a little confusing and I didn't want to get into them in this class. Uh, so you're a rock, paper, scissors game, you, you're not required to have images for. So it's pretty straightforward and it's pretty uh, easy for this to work. Now, there's little things that we can do associated with uh, this. And one of the things that we can do is we can generate Java docs. And let's see if I can find that. Right, Java doc. What Java docs are, are there a series of help files that you can incorporate to your documentation for this application?
Oh, somehow got the package names incorrect. I should match the folder that it's in. I'll bet you that's what. Now we're going to go and generate for the Java docs again. Okay, and it did it correctly. And if we look out in the projects directory space, we'll see under target Java doc bundle options. site rather, API docs, we'll see uh, a index that shows all our classes. And when we click on them, it will show a listing of the functions that are available. Shows the inheritance structure of this, all the implemented interfaces, and so on down the line. as well as the properties and the methods. This is similar to the built-in documentation that you get if you search the Oracle site for Java. So if I look up Java local date object, date, time object. This effectively is the same structure as that. We get a list of methods and so on down the line. I don't know why my phone is going crazy. I do apologize for that. This is a new phone. I'm going to try to turn off the volume of it. Is this distracting me if not you? <laughs> All right. Another thing that we get generated is we get generated every time we run it, we get generated a jar file. And jar stands for Java Archive. And if we look under target, there's all the class files that got compiled. I don't see a jar that got generated. Let's look to see under properties where that is that.
build it and it builds successfully. And let's see. There we go. There's our jar. If we build it. And if we go and open this. That is what you can give to uh, someone else to install. I do think we missed a step here. I think we have to create a uh, manifest. And how you create a manifest at Maven. You download the following snippet to your Tom XML file inside the project. Copy it. There's a POM XML file inside my project. You put the main class here. Which is Hilo GUI. Now when you build it, it should give us in this target folder new jar itch let me try to run it from the command line so i get any errors that happens paste it on the desktop I could execute by saying Java dash R. I gain a one point oh snapshot. Not find class high low GUI. Uh, I probably need to put the path in front of it, the package in front of it. And now it goes and runs. So 
the nice thing about creating a jar is that's all I have to give to distribute to someone if I want them to run it. All right. Now, there is a limitation, however, that you can only execute the jar if you have the Java, Java runtime engine. So let's take a step back and let's talk about ways to deploy Java applications that we write. One of the ways is for us to write our Java source code, which can be multiple classes. So many, many different class files in here. That all gets compiled into one jar. A jar then can be sent to any machine, in theory, any machine on any platform. Install the jar. And as long as they have the right Java runtime engine on the machine, they can execute and run that jar. So this is one way of deploying a Java application, and that is by creating and distributing jar files to people that want to use them. Now, you can write more involved installation routines than simply delivering the jar file. You can write it to initialize some properties and make setting files, all that sort of stuff as well, initialize a database and so on. So you can make a script that would install uh, a Java application. But in general terms, one way to distribute it is that everyone has their own copy of the program. Everyone running it has a jar file. Right? A disadvantage of that is you have to make sure that that jar file is updated whenever there are corrections, bug fixes, or enhancements made to the program. And the way that you'd correct it is redistribute that jar file to everyone that had a copy of the initial one. So they effectively would have to reinstall or update their current application. Right, so that would be one way of distributing it. The upside of it is it can run untethered. In other words, you don't have to be connected to the web to run the application because you actually have a copy of it locally. Another way to, to, to deploy these applications would be to create like a web interface and access the Java classes that you've written through uh, a web GUI. Whereas the Java code only lived on the web server and it got processed by the web server. All right, that would have the advantage that no one would have to have a copy of the Java virtual machine. Only the web server would have to have it. Uh, it's easy to, to, to deploy changes because you would only need to deploy the changes to the web server. However, downside of that is you'd need to be connected to the web in order to run the program. You couldn't run it untethered. And again, these days that's becoming less and less of an issue because pretty much no matter what you can, with your mobile devices or whatever, you can get a connection uh, to the web and access to a web server somewhere. So let's talk about your next program. And your next, pro and your next program you'll do in NetBeans. And you'll turn in the NetBeans project. What do I mean by the NetBeans project? I mean everything contained in the project folder that you create. So in my case, you take this folder that contains source and target. And could turn it in. Including the jar. And I think including the Java docs. I don't recall if that was part of the assignment or not. Let me go check.
I, um, I stand corrected. You do not have to do this through net beans, but uh, I think the next assignment will require to do it. So if you want to do it in net beans, you're welcome to do that and turn that in for round 12. But if you want to do this the old way, you can, you can do it just uh, through an editor in the command line. So you have that option. Google lab either through that beads or through standard way that we have been so far. I thought this, I got confused about what this lab required. I thought this lab required you to use NetBeans. So let's talk about what our classes are going to look like. We're going to have classes, at least. We're going to have our GUI class. We're going to have our games rules class. Right? Now, our GUI class, in order to play rock, paper, and scissors, what do you need? You need some way of the user to putting their choice in. So that could be a radio button. Could be a drop down. It should not be a text box, though, right? Where the person has to type in rock, paper, and scissors because someone could spell it wrong. All right? Or whatever. There's only three choices. Therefore, it should either be a drop down or radio buttons. There should then be a button to play the game. And then there should be a label that's going to display the results. Will this GUI have all the checking to see, like, does rock beat be paper and does uh, paper beat uh, rock, does scissors beat paper, whatever? No. All that will be in the rules object. This GUI will have a rules object. And there'll be a method on the rules object called play. It's going to accept the user's choice. What is the user's choice? You can do it a couple different ways. You can make it zero, one, or two to be rock, paper, and scissors. Or you could use an enumeration. Remember, we talked about enumerations either last class or the class before. That's a way to guarantee that something only equals certain list of values. We could use the enumeration to designate the choices for rock, paper, and scissors. The play method will take whatever the user's choice was and evaluate it. It will first randomly generate computer's choice. Then it will have a series of if statements. If the user's choice equals the player's choice, then it's a tie. Otherwise, you'll follow the standard rules that, let's see, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, paper beats rock. I think that's the right ones. Then you return the results. And the results can't be a Boolean, right? Because there are three options. You can win, lose, or tie. So my suggestion would be either to use an enumeration for that, just like you use enumerations for the choices, or do something like return one means that the player won, return a zero means the player tied, return a negative one means that the player lost. So when this button is pressed, you've already created the rules object in the constructor of this GUI. So you already have a rules object. You're gonna take the user's choice from here 
call the play method, let the play method evaluate, generate the random computer's choice and evaluate all the choices, and then return either a, a one, a zero, or a negative one. That gets sent back here, and the UI will take that and it will take one and change it to U1. Display that on the screen. If it's a zero, it will return, we'll change it to, it was a tie, and if it was a negative one, it will change it to that you lost. It's important to separate these things because what if I had a different place in my application where I wanted to play rock, paper, and scissors? Not from this little mini desktop application, but what if I wanted to write Android code to do a rock, paper, scissors application? This roles object would be the same, but the GUI would be different. The GUI would be a GUI developed in Android. Right. Remember that you can separate the business logic or the problem logic from the GUI logic, uh, uh, the GUI logic, the better situation that you're going to be in. We talked about one way that you can distribute a Java app. That is by creating a jar file and distributing that among the people who need to run it. The disadvantage of that is it's harder to maintain because if you make a change to the application, you have to redistribute the jar file. There's also the restriction that everyone running the program has to have the Java, Java runtime engine. Next week, we'll talk about Android a bit. And we will talk about uh, Java web projects, things such as JSP pages and Java servlets. And we'll talk about the difference between those two uh, and how those two work. Again, my mistake about Lab 12, you do not need to use NetBeans for it, but you're welcome to do NetBeans if you want to. Part of Lab 13 will almost certainly be to convert rock, paper, scissors into uh, net beans. So you can just as well get a head start on it. All right. Yes. We do have two lab 12 in our. We have two lab 12s. Oh. That's why. That's what. Yeah. That could very yeah. well be why I'm confused. Let me look. Here to, to uh, one second. Okay, so lab 12. I think that this one 13 is also due this week. Okay, that's a mistake. This one is due this week, but this one should be lab 13 and should be due next week. So the rock, paper, scissors should be next week? Rock, paper, scissors is due next week. Right. Let me make that change. Thank you for pointing that out. That will be due on. Twenty sixth, and should be called Lab Thirteen. I think your last lab will be due will be to take this and to bring it into uh, NetBeans and to create a jar and create Java docs. So, um, just as a, a heads up, uh, if you want to start this one using NetBeans, you're welcome to do that. All right. Thanks for pointing that out. That's all I had for today. Uh, we will see you up in lab or we will see you next week.